started and will be posted on our website. We will send you an email letting you know when it's available. We have one final request. You will receive a session evaluation after the webinar. Please take five minutes to complete it and send it to us. This webinar is funded by the United States Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance. Thanks for your participation. So please welcome, actually in the office with me today, Program Manager of Justice Initiatives, Leanne Davis, for some opening remarks. Good afternoon, everyone. We're so excited to have you on the webinar today. I just wanted to mention that for those of you who are not aware, um, our National Center on Criminal Justice and Disability has been refunded for another two years. And so as we go into the next two years, we really want to hear from you in terms of what kinds of topics you would like to hear more of. And so please, as you um, listen to the webinar today and think through the webinars that we've provided over the past two years, uh, we'd like to hear what it is that you want to see more of and to be able to provide that to you over the next coming two years. So we thank you so much for your participation. We know that um, the area around sex offending behavior is a huge issue in this field. Uh, we've seen that from the number of people attending these webinars, and which is why we had the second one today. So we appreciate the presenters for being willing to share the information that you have on this topic. And we look forward to continuing to provide you with a quality information on issues that um, have been difficult uh, to really um, be able to provide information from other agencies. So thank you so much for attending the webinar today, and we look forward to many more in the future. All right. So I'd like to begin today by thanking our presenters. You'll hear more about each of the three of them um, as we get into the presentation. And I'm going to start with just a very quick few disability basics. We'd like all of you to understand and know the challenges that people with disabilities face. Um, understand that knowing one person with a disability means you know one person with a disability and that lived experiences are very different. Um, and that this is a human rights issue, just like race, gender, or religion. Um, today's talk is going to focus on a brain-based disability that falls under the developmental disability category, autism spectrum disorder. Um, so you can see in our chart here kind of where that stacks up in uh, the realm of disability generally. And there are a couple of points we'd like for you to remember. These are hard issues to discuss and are rarely as clear cut as we would like. People with disabilities should take responsibility for their actions, and likewise, society should acknowledge true risk and support people. You don't have to reinvent the wheel around these issues, and there are seasoned professionals doing great work, and we are happy to bring you information from three of those professionals today. So uh, let me make you the presenter here. Uh, Dr. Alexander Westfall has a clinical and research focus on autism spectrum disorders. He is based in the Division of Law and Psychiatry in Yale's Department of Psychiatry as a consulting forensic psychiatrist for Connecticut's Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. So please welcome Dr. Westfall. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I just wanted to make sure everyone can hear me. So can you hear me, Catherine, on that end? Yes, you're good. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to discuss autism spectrum disorders and sexual misbehavior from a theoretical perspective. Um, so first off, I wanted to talk about um, briefly aspects of the current DSM criteria of autism that are relevant to the rest of our discussion. Um, so first off, we have persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction across multiple contexts. This, the word autism itself has its words in a Greek, or has its roots in a Greek word, um, autos, which means self to the exclusion of others, as in alone or by oneself, or self not prompted or influenced by another. You can see it is at the root of other words um, than autism, which have something to do with the meaning, including autonomous and automatic. Um, another important criteria is restricted and repetitive patterns of behavior, interests, or activities. One aspect of this can be insistence on sameness, inflexible adherence to routines or ritualized patterns of, or verbal, nonverbal behavior. 
Another aspect of this is highly restricted fixated interests that are abnormal intensity or in focus. And another aspect, yet another aspect, is hypo or hyper reactivity to sensory input or unusual interests in sensory aspects of the domain, um, of the environmental domain. So each of these aspects I've just mentioned can lead to problematic be sexual behaviors. Um, and just as an example, a tangible example, I just saw a presentation at the recent um, American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law meeting, which discussed a man with an autism spectrum disorder who focused, who was very interested in soil diapers, um, something which I've also seen in my practice. Um, the argument that in this presentation that the person gave was that it was very rooted in sensory aspects of his disorder. So I think that that's an interesting angle. Um, I wanted to talk today about a particular case um, as a way to introduce the rest of my talk. This is a case of a man named Jacob Fisher um, in Nebraska. It captures a number of themes I want to talk about today. He, at the time of his arrest, was a 20-year-old with an autism spectrum disorder and also limited intellectual function, who was accused of entering the unlocked house of a neighbor and stealing some underwear. He received between a 20 and 60 month sentence for this, which is a very strict, steep sentence for those of you who haven't dealt with that sort of thing before, despite the fact that he had no previous convictions. Um, he w was incarcerated and shortly into his um, jail sentence, he was beaten up very badly and received a broken jaw and a number of other injuries. Um, so I'm going to skip through um, these slides, which are things that um, were said, but here, here's just what I was just saying. He received a broken cheekbone and fractured eye socket from an assault by other inmates. So you can see based on that event that Jacob Fisher was a victim, but he was also a perpetrator. Um, so I want you to think about that distinction uh, and remember that most people with autism in the criminal justice system are victims. But when we do talk about perpetrators, I want to divide things into two categories, um, legitimate perpetration and counterfeit perpetration. In Fisher's case, although he did steal underwear, and that might have scary sexualized connotations to some people, it might also reflect something much less scary. For, an, for example, an area of focused interest or compulsive behavior, which had absolutely no implications for his risk of committing harm to others. I think that this is an important point, that behaviors which in a typical person might be indicative of something um, alarming might in someone with autism come from an entirely different source. I'll send, spend a significant portion of the rest of my talk trying to clarify this point from a variety of angles. Um, so I first encountered this term counterfeit deviance in the work of an attorney, Mark Mahoney. I, um, he wrote a paper um, discussing Asperger's and child pornography um, in which he introduced the term um, in the autism context. But the term dates back to 1991 and Griffiths, Kingsberger and Prinzi used it to describe a scenario in which a person with intellectual disability behaved in a way which appeared to be paraphilic, but in fact was driven by something else. And I think that this concept is equally useful for thinking about autism spectrum disorders as it is for intellectual disabilities. So just moving on to my next slides. I've been, um, I'm going to make the argument that counterfeit deviance is integrally related to the concept of theory of mind, deficits of which are fundamental to autism spectrum disorders. So what is theory of mind? Um, so theory of mind, and just here's that concept I was saying, I think that counterfeit deviance is, um, an aspect of theory of mind, and the mechanism which connects them is the inability to see how one's behavior may appear to others. So when you have a breakdown in theory of mind, it erodes your ability to see how you appear to others, and that can lead to counterfeit deviance. So just going into theory of mind for a second, um, the kind of classic task in theory of mind is the Sally Ann ta um, task. And so um, what you see here is a cartoon clip there's Sally, there's Anne. Sally puts a ball in her basket. Sally goes away. Anne moves the ball to her box. And then Sally comes back. Where will Sally look for her ball? And so when you ask this question to someone with um, a deficit in theory of mind, they may very well answer, um, Sally will look for the ball in the box because they're missing the point that Anne 
didn't actually witness Sally moving the ball, and they're just focusing on the fact that the ball is in the box, and so taking it very literally. Um, as I, I wanted to give a video clip briefly to illustrate how this can play out. In It's a video clip, it's a movie, but in real life. And so I'm just loading this right now. This is a clip from the film Adam. Hello, so what you see, what you see in that footage um, is what I was trying to describe. So Adam doesn't recognize the way in which his behavior would appear to others. So he's watching children, something that all of us like to do. Um, it's fun to watch children and it's nice, but most of us would not go up to a school which we had nothing to do with and look um, at the playground simply because we're concerned about the way it would appear to other people. But this point was lost on Adam. When the cop um, came to him, he said, I was just watching the children. Why, why is that a problem, essentially? And so you can see how a situation like that can um, have kind of scary connotations to typical people, but in fact means very little um, in terms of the motivations of the person with autism. So then back again to my schematic, you can see in Adam's case how his deficit in theory of mind undermined, undermined his ability to see how his behaviors appeared to others. And as a result, what you had is an example of counterfeit deviance. So I've been emphasizing the um, importance of a thoughtful approach to the assessment of offenders with ASD because there may be unexpected root causes to the behavior. As I mentioned, I do not think that this is always the case. And I've seen many examples in which it is my impression that things are as they appear. Um, but I do think it's really important to remember that things can be different than they appear also. I wanted now to turn briefly to another class of issues that have, in my opinion, to do with the fact that the internet has put almost anything in the world at a user's fingertips. One of the most common reasons for people with autism to get into trouble is internet-based crimes, and in particular, viewing images of child exploitation. Most of my, um, the rest of my talk will be focused on this topic. I wanted to talk about gateway phenomena. What are gates? Well, they're the public face of something that is intended to be kept private. The term gateway is part of the standard lingo in a discussion about substances, but I also think that the concept is equally applicable to things you encounter on the internet. In fact, as you will see in a minute, I think there are gateway factors which predate the internet. Here are several factors which I think are gateways. First is neoteny, and I'll explain what that is in a second. Next, mainstream sexualization of minors. Um, another category is naturism videos. And finally, another category is legal pornography with juvenile themes. I wanted to request that anyone, uh, I'll have my email at the end, but anyone who thinks of other gateway phenomena, please do send them to me, because I, I know that there's gotta be more of them out there. I just um, would be interested in hearing other people's opinions. So I'm only gonna discuss the first two of these. Um, in the interest of time. First one being neoteny, which is the retention of juvenile features in an adult animal. And I'm turning now to an image of Betty Boop, um, who's an old school cla cartoon class character. 
Um, her sort of features are labeled, um, sometimes labeled as neotenous. She's got short legs um, relative to her total height, um, and she makes clumsy childlike movements when you see her in um, video clips. But more to the point, Betty Boop was described in a 1934 court case as combining in appearance the childish with the sophisticated, a large round baby face with big eyes and a nose-like button framed in a somewhat careful coiffure with a very small body of which perhaps the leading characteristic is the most self-confident little bust imaginable. So this case had nothing to do with sexual offending. It was a copyright case, but you can see how even to um, you know, the casual observer, this neotenous aspect of this image jumps out. In a more ex a direct example of this phenomenon, I wanted to mention graphic cartoons, of which this is a PG-13 version. Much of the effect of these cartoons depends on neoteny. This is a sexualized adult body with a child's face. It makes complete sense to me that viewing images from this genre is a step towards viewing images of the sexual abuse of children. So it's an example of what I mean when I talk about gateway images. In a, um, this is an example, I think, these images of mainstream sexualization of minors. And I think that this is also a very important thing to recognize that in our culture, um, we, we, this is a very, very common common thing. Um, and I wanted to turn briefly and mention to the, the Copine criteria, which are um, out of Europe, and it's a network. Um, you can see what, what it's about there. But I wanted to point out that um, at about numbers five to six, um, is the transition point where an image becomes illegal. And turning back just to this sexualization of minors image, if you think about these images and look at the criteria, it's pretty clear to me that that is an example of erotic posing of an, a clothed child in sexualized or provocative poses. And so I think this sort of image is right on the border of um, illegal images of sexual abuse of children, but it's part of the mainstream. So I've talked about a couple of things, counterfeit deviance, gateway phenomenon, um, and I also have um, talked about some examples of gateway phenomena. So I think these are all important things to keep in mind when you're doing an evaluation of someone with an autism spectrum disorder who's in trouble for some sort of sexual issue. I wanted to mention briefly a couple of resources, this book by Dennis Debo, which gives a lot of good advice on how to prepare people with autism in their families for interactions with law enforcement officials. I also wanted to mention a couple of other resources, a great publishing house, diversecity.com, which has um, resources on sexuality and developmental disabilities, teaching people about sexuality and has some very um, sort of thorough, detailed um, information. And also I mentioned uh, Mark Mahoney's work and here's his website. So I deeply appreciate the time you took, took um, listening to this. And again, I would um, appreciate if you have examples of this um, gateway, these gateway phenomena, please do contact me at alexander.westfall at yale.edu. Thank you so much. And I'm turning this over to Lori Sperry now. Thank you for that great information. Um, so our next presenter, Dr. Lori Sperry, is a board certified behavior analyst who has worked to establish autism support programs in underserved communities in developing countries. She works with forensic autism cases, specializing in pre and post conviction diagnoses, parole and sentencing hearings, and writing amicus curiae briefs. Please welcome Dr. Sperry. Thank you everyone, and thank you for joining us for this very important webinar. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about framing the discussion of sexual offending in ASD. Now, we, when we consider um, Dr. Westfall's ideas and the traits of ASD that might place a person with ASD at risk for uh, committing these crimes, consider the idea of theory of mind. In the special case of child pornography, which we'll be talking about today, there will be a lack of perspective taking on the part of the person with ASD in terms of the harm done to the children exploited in these images. Moreover, impairments in executive functioning might inhibit the person's ability to think through the consequences of their behavior or the what ifs.
Many parents call adolescence the second crisis, and if you've been working in the field of autism for a while, I'm sure you've heard that from parents. There becomes this big disparity between um, the, the sexual feelings that the person with ASD may be having and their out of sync level of development and awareness. Um, individuals who have developmental disabilities have lower levels of sexual knowledge and experience in all areas except menstruation and body part identification when they're compared with the typical student population in high schools and middle schools. In other words, they understand some of the mechanics as they relate to sex, but what they're missing is the social piece that allows them to access those mechanics. So in this study, researchers investigated the socio-sexual knowledge, experiences, and interests of people with ASD. Participants were shown this series of pictures and asked, what are the people doing in this picture? And for me, this picture in particular highlights how the cognitive differences, including central coherence, theory of mind deficits, and the literal nature of the person with ASD exacerbates the deficits in social sexual understanding. Now, it won't surprise you to learn that um, the legal pornography industry is more than a $20, $20 billion a year global industry. And if this top figure represents legal pornography, one can only imagine what the illegal industry generates every year financially. Pornography viewers who are neurotypical are at risk for increases in uh, developing sexually deviant tendencies, increased risk of committing a sexual offense, and increased risk at accepting rape myths. So um, it's not clear how much greater the risk is for the viewer with ASD, but if we think about how people with ASD have visual learning strengths and how they tend to gravitate towards online activities, it's reasonable to assume that at the very least, these risks are similar, if not greater, for the viewer with ASD. Now, in particular, when we think about vulnerabilities of internet users with ASD, adolescents with ASD spend, on average, 4.4 hours a day online, uh, to the exclusion of all other leisure activities. And part of the issue with uh, viewing online pornography is that in the absence of appropriate sexuality education, which Dr. Lofton will talk, to, talk about, um, and a peer group with whom they can vet information, the internet, and in particular pornography, often becomes the sole source of their sexual knowledge. Not coincidentally, a study by the Kaiser Family Foundation found that 70% of first-time teen viewers of pornography accidentally stumbled upon it online. By the time they're 18, 93% of all boys and 62% of girls have been exposed to online pornography, and 15% of boys and 9% of girls have stumbled upon images of child exploitation before the age of 18. Now, in his excellent paper on Asperger's syndrome and the criminal law, attorney Mark Mahoney talks about this and points out that oftentimes the distinction between of age and underage females is intentionally blurred. Think about the images that Dr. Westfall shared with us and his comments about the cultural sexualization of young girls by the popular media. One can then begin to appreciate how extremely difficult it is for the person with ASD to make the determination between what is legal and what carries severe criminal penalties. Now bear with me when I make what might seem like a bit of a dog leg to video modeling, but I will attach it to autism. The concept of modeling or observational learning as an intervention technique was first introduced by Bandura 40 years ago as part of his seminal work on social learning theory. And he demonstrated that children can acquire a vast array of skills by observing other people performing those skills. 
and that the uh, model doesn't even have to be present, uh, nor does reinforcement have to be present for the person to perform the behaviors in settings other than the setting in which it was originally observed. Again, for those of you that have been in the field of autism for a long time, you have likely used video modeling. We use it many, many times as a strategy to promote skill acquisition, and skills learned through video modeling are maintained over time and can be transferred across people and settings. So here's the connection. It's possible that given the strong visual learning skills of people with ASD and the success of video modeling as a strategy to teach pro-social behaviors, that pornography or images of child exploitation may be serving as a video model for sexually offending behavior. Now this might in part be explained by something called difficulties in syllogistic reasoning. This is a form of reasoning that allows a person to draw conclusions, whether valid or not, for, from using rules of logic. So inferences might be drawn from empirically false content, and that's heavily uh, dependent upon their background knowledge. Now we've already established that people with ASD have a paucity of background knowledge uh, in terms of social and sexual functioning. So what may end up happening is that when they see these images on the internet, images of pornography and child exploitation, because of their literal understanding and their cognitive differences, they may be taking these images of hyperbole at face value. Um, and they might be particularly uh, susceptible to these kinds of hyperbole, misogynistic behaviors, and rape myths that are perpetuated by pornography. Now, a neurotypical adolescent may be able to alter their beliefs when they're presented with evidence to the contrary, but people with autism tend to engage in belief persistence, um, and they're more heavily in, um, influenced by their knowledge about the world and the social stereotypes that they have formed. So with little knowledge about the social and sexual world, they may take those images at face value and continue to believe what those images uh, are perpetuating despite evidence or information to the contrary. So the potential pathways to offending for people with ASD may indeed be very different from the pathways to offending for the general population. Process models serve to explain the course of offending and the antecedents, behaviors, and consequences related to that offending behavior. Um, so pathways to child sexual abuse typically progress through various stages. And stage one is that specific sexual attraction to a child. Stage two is when the offender develops mechanisms to override their inhibitions. Um, so they may use drugs or alcohol to override their inhibitions. Stage three is when the offender surmounts external obstacles. So savvy predators may seek out positions of trust. Um, and then finally in stage four, the predator attempts to conquer the child's noncompliance by breaking down adult child barriers and escalating the type and amount of sexual activity, often through the use of force or threats against the child or their family. And they may also use something called attractors, like video games, electronics, money, um, or interactors to lower the child's inhibitions, uh, so alcohol or pornography. Now for the person with ASD, um, the pathways are different. So we have naivete. Um, many of the clients that, uh, that Dr. Lofton and Dr. Westfall and I have worked with have been duped into a behavior that reaches the level of criminality. I dare you to fill in the blank. Um, people with ASD often get duped into committing crimes. And then to the more serious crime, here in Denver, Colorado, recently we had a 19-year-old with developmental disabilities with an estimated IQ of 70. He committed uh, or participated in a very, very serious 
um, uh, gang rape of an intoxicated and unconscious minor because his younger brother convinced him it was okay because the girl was not saying no. Um, then there's the lack of sexual awareness. Uh, so these behaviors might include masturbating in public, urinating public, exposing oneself in public. Um, so not understanding or appreciating that these are behaviors that are private and should happen in a private place. Um, and then there's that piece of lack of understanding of inappropriateness of a sexual relationship with a minor. Uh, there was a person who told his, his own story uh, in the last webinar that I encourage you to, to look at. Um, there's also the case of a 20-year-old man with ASD who followed what he understood what the rules to be. You have to know the person. You have to like the person. You have to get the person's permission to have sex. He did all of that. The one piece that he failed to do was to understand that it was not okay with the 10-year-old neighbor. So um, that was a piece that uh, did not occur to anyone working with him uh, to talk to him about age of consent. Um, and then finally, that sexual preoccupation. Um, and this relates back to that idea that as children with ASD grow older, their social and sexual skill sets are likely to become more disparate with their chronological age and their appearance. They may still more closely identify with themselves as a child and have no idea how to be physically intimate with an adult. So I'd like to end with these two quotes um, that I think for me really highlight the differences in offending. Um, and this first quote comes from a sexual offender who once said to me, show me a kid who doesn't know about sex and I'll show you my next victim. And the second is a quote from a sexual offender with autism who said to me, I learned the rules by breaking them. Um, so joining us next will be Dr. Lofton, who will be talking about how to teach those rules so that the person with ASD does not find themselves a follow of the law. Here is my contact information. Um, I welcome any information or feedback that you have. Um, and uh, I believe that Catherine has made this available, but here are the references that I used, um, and you are certainly welcome to those. Thank you so much for your time today, and I am turning this over to my colleague, Dr. Rachel Lofton. All right, thank you for that great information. And for everyone out there, the PowerPoint will be posted along with the recorded webinar in a week or so on our website, so you'll have access to all of those materials. Um, so now on to Dr. Lofton. Dr. Lofton is clinical director for the AARTS Center at Rush University Medical Center, and she specializes in evaluations, consultation, and interventions for children and adults with autism spectrum disorder. Dr. Lofton consults in criminal and educational legal cases involving people with ASD. So please welcome Dr. Lofton. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to jump right in. Um, what I'd like to do in the next 15 minutes or so is kind of talk through the rationale a little bit. I think you've gotten a really great setup from my colleagues, um, but I'm going to give you a little bit more about the rationale. Um, and then talk about some specifics of the approach and teaching that I think um, really benefit this population. Um, I want everyone to keep in mind that even though we're going to be talking quite a bit and have been talking quite a bit about offending, victimization is really the primary risk for people with autism spectrum disorder much, much, much more likely to be the victim of anything happening than to actually perpetrate. Um, and then I think quite often failure to teach and deficits that are inherent in ASD can lead to inadvertent criminal sexual behavior. So stalking illegal images of usually of um, child sexual abuse um, and aggression are the, the primary things that we see that really there's been a failure to teach um, and then that leads to the criminal behavior. Um, I want to talk a little bit about sexual behavior in autism, and there's a real question about how much sexual behavior there really is. Historically, the thought was that a very high percentage of people on the spectrum were asexual. Um, kind of funny, they decided to do these studies by interviewing parents um, or other caretakers. So it's very likely that the high numbers 
that we see of asexuality are an overestimate. Um, certainly, asexuality might occur at a higher rate in ASD than in the general population, but it's, it's likely much lower than the estimates that are in the literature right now. Um, there was one study fairly recently that found about 10% of adults with ASD have some sort of sexual relationship. Um, it's interesting because, in contrast, most people on the spectrum do want an intimate relationship. Um, so many, many, many want an intimate relationship and are unable to achieve it. Um, there are some studies, too, that point to higher rates of bisexuality and homosexuality in ASD, although we really don't have great numbers on, on any of this yet. And I do list the general population stats just so you can be aware of that. Um, go ahead and skip this in the interest of time. I want to be clear, I'm talking a little bit about um, sexual identity and sexual behavior, in particular homosexuality and bisexuality, because any differences in those areas put people at great risk, um, risk of homelessness, risk of other um, mental health concerns, um, and that's even without the ASD. When you add the confounding effects of the social disability that comes with autism, um, you know, this is a very, a very uh, sensitive group and in a group that would need more individualized instruction and extra support to kind of make the transition to adulthood. Um, so where is the question of why there would be a difference in um, sexual identity? So why would more people with ASD identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or trans if they really, in fact, do? Um, John Elder Robeson has a theory, and it's the selectivity theory. I don't know that he came up with it, but he, he certainly wrote about it on his blog. And this is the idea that for some people with autism, they are perhaps just less selective. Um, they know they want some kind of sexual behavior, but they're less picky about uh, with whom they have that behavior. Uh, Autoeroticism. Um, so for some people on the spectrum, they can get kind of everything they need sexually on their own. And so this can appear to the outside world as a person being asexual, but in fact there is a sexual life, it's just a very private sexual life. Um, and then the, the third theory is that there really could just be kind of a filter, um, a lack of filter or a lack of closeting because they don't feel bound by the same social constraints that keep some people um, who are typically developing from coming out. Um, I want to talk about some, some very specific ways to approach sexual behavior in autism and specific ways to approach teaching it from a very young age to make sure that we are preventing problems down the road. Um, the first point is that anything you teach needs to be presented in a very explicit fashion. Um, when talking about sexuality, a lot of people tend to kind of shy away or to use um, metaphors or to be more vague. And unfortunately, when you're teaching somebody with autism, that is really not the way to go. Um, clear terms, precise terms, and explaining it um, as clearly as possible. Uh, a task analytic approach can be helpful, and a task analysis is simply taking a desired behavior and breaking it into all of the components that culminate in the ultimate behavior. So for example, if you wanted to teach dating, um, how to ask someone on a date, um, you would actually want to break it up and make sure that you're teaching every step along the way. And this really helps because any novelty or any area where someone on the spectrum might have to problem solve for themselves uh, could be a potential problem. Incremental um, refers to teaching small steps at a time, so it's a little bit like the task analytic approach, um, but just specifying that you want to make sure you're just doing a little bit at a time to ensure success. I find it helpful to use a lot of examples and non-examples from real life. So this is a time when things went really well with, for someone. This is how it can work out really well. Here's something that didn't go so well for someone else. Here are some of the consequences that happened um, when this failed. I use a lot of visual support, and I find in particular when teaching um, individuals with less verbal ability, the visual support sometimes help convey information that words are just not getting across. And I think I have an example. Oops. Yeah. So um, an example of a visual support, you know, when teaching levels of intimacy, for example, um, this is obviously a British example, so there's mom rather than mom. Um, but you're really kind of looking at each level of the circle and, and showing the child in a very visual way who goes in, in each circle, who is at each level. And then I've taken this a step further and even indicated what physical behaviors are okay in each level. 
So that's an example of a visual support. And here's another. Um, this is a visual support that shows how long it might take to develop a relationship. I run a lot of sexuality education groups for young adults with autism. And what I had found over time is that these guys tended to think that if they met somebody, they liked that person, they went on one or two dates, then the next step was marriage. Um, they had a lot of trouble kind of understanding the sequence and the development to a relationship. And because we know that this population sometimes gets in trouble for stalking and sometimes pushes it too far and, and doesn't really understand where the limits are, um, a visual like this can be very helpful for explaining how relationships unfold over time. Go back to my, here we go. Um, I think it's helpful to return to the same topics repeatedly to check in. So for example, if I taught about um, the mechanics of a sex act um, in September, and I still have the, I'm working with the same group in January, I might, I might want to refresh and ask. This is a great way to see where um, some misunderstandings have come to light, where new questions have developed. Um, and, and it's just, I've been amazed at the information that ends up coming out when I go back to check in. Um, likewise, checking in for comprehension along the way. Um, a lot of people on the spectrum learn some really good tricks for, for, for looking like they understand or looking like they're following along, and yet at the same time, that true comprehension, the understanding of why this is important, why this is meaningful, um, that, that can sometimes be lost. Okay. Um, some other associated elements, so these aren't core features of autism, but these are issues that are associated with autism or occur at a higher rate in autism that are very important to consider. Um, one is executive function, so this is, you know, keeping information in mind, being attentive, um, not being distracted, all of those things kind of, kind of play into executive function. Uh, particular learning styles, so we talked about using visual support. Uh, there are other students for whom, you know, visual support would never be appropriate, and you would want to make certain that you're using uh, verbal supports and oral language to kind of help with comprehension. And then the last element there is anxiety. Um, anxiety occurs at an extremely high rate among people with ASD. Um, and the way this plays out in, in sex ed is, you know, a lot of these guys are afraid to talk about this topic or they're so overcome with social anxiety that even approaching uh, potential partners is really difficult. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to move through these specifics because I want to leave time for questions. But just so you know, these are here. You can go back and look at the elements that contribute. The one thing I do want to remark on, you know, when you're thinking about the learning style of people on the spectrum, um, that seeing the forest through the trees um, metaphor is really helpful here. So people with autism tend to kind of get stuck on one part and might miss the whole. So in teaching, it's really important to address the whys. Um, why, why is it important to um, be polite and non-threatening when you're a man approaching a woman? Why might a woman be afraid of you? Um, and filling in the why portions and making sure that there's real meaningful comprehension there. Um, I'm going to go ahead through this, too, because we have about 15 minutes for questions now. So I just want to hit on what are some of the important elements to make sure that are covered. Um, I saw a question pop up while I was talking. I couldn't read the whole thing because I was doing two other things at once. But it was a question about when to introduce a particular topic. And I think one thing to keep in mind with all these topics is it would almost be hard to introduce it too early. So as long as you're giving information that's developmentally appropriate and meaningful for the person, I really don't think you ever have to worry about teaching something too early. Um, my fear would always be teaching too late. Um, so the first is hygiene and self-care, um, how to do it, what's the schedule. If a child um, has an electronic device or a young adult has a, a phone, um, I'll often encourage them to put a schedule right in their phone. Um, here's, here's your alarm. When your alarm goes off, you take a shower. That's something we do every day. And underscore the why there. Why does it matter? Why do you need to take a shower every day? Um, terms for anatomy, both proper terms and slang terms. And the same thing, sex acts, proper terms and slang terms. Um, 
Unfortunately, a lot of times just the proper terms are taught, and then you have somebody who really can't communicate with their peers about sex because proper terms are very rarely used by young people. Um, teaching about masturbation, what it is, what it means, where it's okay to do it, and then physical safety concerns. So there are some studies in the literature that look at case studies of problem sexual behaviors in autism, and some of those include some, some atypical ways of masturbating that, that lead to physical injury. So um, keeping an eye out for the physical safety concerns. And then actually teaching the, the mechanics of the partner sex acts as well as I think the social piece of when these things normally happen in a relationship. Um, in this mechanics area in particular, I think the pornography viewing can be really damaging because you know, some of these young men will log onto the internet, they'll, they'll see pornography, and they'll really take it literally. They'll take it quite literally to mean, oh, the first time you have sex, anal sex is involved, or, or things you know, progress in such a quick way. And so I think kind of that same timeline that I showed for developing relationships, it might be helpful to talk through um, with a young adult kind of what typically can happen in a relationship and what is it that they want to have happen for them, you know, what's reasonable for them. Um, a number of social pieces here um, are very important to teach. Um, and I want to underscore again the personal responsibilities and values. I think it's really hard for all of us to kind of approach this topic without our own biases showing. But if we can help um, the young adult with autism understand what is important for him or her and, and how do they want to live and what do they want to have happen for them. Um, and then I think it's really important, we, we touched a little bit on the media influence. But um, I, I often, when I present on this topic, I like to spend even more time talking about how distorting um, media can be for somebody with autism. Um, you know, if you think of examples from romantic comedies or think of examples from television shows, if in real life we ran around behaving exactly as they do in television, we would all have stalking charges. We would all have um, some of these allegations against us. And so I think. People with autism who, as Dr. Speary pointed out, can be so susceptible to the visual modeling and, and do respond often in a very strong way to, to video samples and don't necessarily reason through and understand that this is a fictional depiction and this is not how I should behave. Um, I, you know, I, th I think they're very vulnerable to um, criminal behavior just based on, you know, kind of modeling from TV. So explicit instruction. I think some really clear rules and guidelines for here's what normally happens in society or here's what you want to have happen for you and this is how it's going to be, but making that as explicit and concrete as possible. And then providing appropriate models for relationships. So even though a lot of young adults with autism have family members um, who have great relationships and have you know, maybe been dating for years or had things happen. It may very well be that the person with autism has never put it together and never fully understood the nature of the relationship. Um, so sometimes even just talking through relationship models of other people they actually know can be very helpful. Um, and then it can kind of help counteract that media influence. Um, and then the last example I encourage you to look through on your own, because I'm going to go ahead and end so we have time for questions, is just all the specific aspects that I think are important when you're teaching about using um, pornography. Um, and one of, the, one of the very clear things I tell the young adults I work with is never Google the word teen. Always include woman, if, you know, if you're looking for woman or man, if you're looking for man. Um, but even, even teen, so when that comes up, to be very cautious. And I, I do warn them very specifically about what can happen if they inadvertently uh, kind of end up viewing the wrong sort of image. Um, okay. Thanks. I'll let it go back to Catherine then so we can take questions. Great. Thank you so much for your presentation today, um, all three of you. And so I'm going to start asking some questions that we've received throughout the presentation. And uh, for our presenters, make sure to unmute yourself when you want to speak. Um, and you can turn your cameras back on, too, and then people can see you when you're speaking. Uh, so the first one we have uh, is, is there any training designed for law enforcement or including police officers in it so that they can know how to approach this issue? All right, remember, you got to unmute yourself. This is Alexander Westfall. I know that Dennis Debo, whose book I shared, and I think his website was on there, 
um, is an ex-cop and does a number of trainings um, for law enforcement types. Great. Anybody else? That was going to be my suggestion as well. All right. Uh, the next question. I have a client with both intellectual and developmental disability and autism spectrum disorder who has been banished from nearly every social place, camp, dances, et cetera, because he touched an adult female at his job at Goodwill. We're having a terrible time trying to find this young man a job, which he wants desperately to make connections at a day program or something due to nobody wanting to risk having him. Do you have strategies? What can we do? How can we help this man? I what suggestion I would have is to very explicitly teach kind of what the rules are um, and, and somehow find a way to demonstrate through data collection that he's showing that he understands the rules. Um, and I, I would hope, you know, if you're able to collect this data and to demonstrate progress, um, that would be something that you could then show potential employers or could show, um, you know, directors or people who are in a position to kind of open up some doors for him. I, and I think that um, that question actually is, uh, it highlights uh, the challenges um, with charges when, when people with autism find themselves in contact with the criminal justice system because um, there is such a, a tremendous unemployment rate to begin with for people with disabilities. Um, and uh, once there's the added uh, offense, um, trying to find them places to live, places to uh, be employed, um, opportunities within the community, um, they, they are just uh, even more disadvantaged. And, and so, you know, that, that really does speak to, uh, that's a perfect example of what happens when someone with autism, uh, you know, engages in a behavior that reaches the level of criminality when it, you know, the function of the behavior may have been to get someone's attention and then their sexual connotations to that behavior. All right, next question. Um, let's see. I work with an adolescent with ASD who is going through puberty, and I'm curious as how would one uh, how one would begin to broach this topic of appropriate self pleasure or awareness of sexuality. So just how to start out. Um, well, I guess that uh, I could start with that one. Um, you know, I think it's easy to jump in. I, I think part of the part of the difficulty is just kind of getting over your own reservations about talking about it. Um, but most young adults have the awareness that oh, if I touch myself, it feels good, or, or they have some kind of understanding of it. And I think setting it up in a very neutral, like yes, yeah, this is a this is a human thing. It's true for everybody. Um, I want to give you some rules about it so you stay safe and um, other people don't get in trouble and you don't get in trouble. So here are some rules about it. Um, but I think approaching it in a very nonchalant, kind of factual way um, sets the child up to be more comfortable to share information and, and to talk openly. You know, one of the things that, that I've used as well is um, uh, kind of tying it back to structured teaching. Uh, and even with very young children, we teach them that certain things happen in certain places. So um, I play in the play corner, I uh, eat at the snack table, and um, that makes it much easier to have that conversation with someone when they're an adolescent private things happen in private places. So if I eat at the snack table, I masturbate in the bathroom or in my bedroom, you know, my private bathroom or my private bedroom, certain things happen in certain places. And this is really just a developmental extension of, of that idea of, you know, arranging the environment to let them know where particular behaviors um, occur. Um, and, and so I found that to be a very helpful strategy as well. Yeah, and to, to piggyback on that, I think even starting at three and four, when you see a child begin to explore their genitals when they're, they're in the living room, um, you know, with my own daughter, my, my comment was always, hey, it's totally cool that you're doing that, but that's a bedroom or a bathroom thing, so you need to get out of here. Um, so just, you know, whatever the language is that the individual understands, but the starting it at a very young age so that not, it's not all of a sudden happening at once when you turn to 12. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And, and to tie it back to structured teaching, um, another thing I've done is when we have people engaging in masturbation, uh, you know, during the day or repeatedly, um, we build it into their schedules, um, you know, private time into their schedules. So um, I've worked with families where they have downtime when the child first gets home from school and uh, they are able to go into their bedrooms in a demand-free environment and engage in that behavior. And just setting some parameters around it when families are, you know, calling to say, my son or daughter, uh, you know, uh, it started masturbating in the middle of Walgreens, you know, and that usually um, is, is pretty upsetting for everybody, uh, the community and the family. So, you know, letting them know that there are also times to do that and making sure that that's the part of the schedule as, as you're working on, uh, and then this is a private thing that happens in a private place. Sorry, I have one more thing to add to that. Um, I, I've had so many guys, too, who have particular behaviors that were allowed in a school environment. So maybe in high school they got away with doing a certain thing. And then when they transition um, to adulthood and they're out in the real world, all of a sudden that behavior is illegal or can get them arrested. So I also think it's, it's really crucial, and masturbation is a big one of these, where uh, I was just telling Dr. Westfall um, the other day that there was a student who was actually allowed to masturbate in the classroom as long as the divider was up. And that's a huge problem. Like he's in the same room with other people. And for someone who overgeneralizes or doesn't, doesn't understand distinctions, um, that's a huge problem. And so these are the very same guys who then graduate and get and get arrested because they're doing these things out in the community. So I think it's important um, from an educational perspective to kind of put some limits around this stuff and to structure it from a very young age so that's just always the expectation. Thank you. All right, so we've got time for, I'm going to share one comment that was made in the Q&A section and one more question. And the comment is, one elephant in the room here is that when people desexualize people with disabilities, they feel that it's less necessary to teach sexuality. Many autistic kids don't even participate in mainstream health classes because they're pulled out for special instruction at that time. Um, and additionally, this person says, I think we need to be very careful about the distinction between acknowledging that sometimes innocuous behaviors by autistic people can come across as predatory and suggesting that autistic people are actually more likely to engage in these kinds of serious behaviors. So um, two very, very great comments on the information you guys have shared today. Um, and then one, one final question. I think Dr. Lofton, you started um, kind of touching on this. What are some uh, either first steps or most important steps families should take to help protect their child with autism from viewing and or becoming addicted to child pornography? So I really liked your practical tips earlier about what to Google and that kind of thing. So if you guys have any other suggestions. I, I often advise families um, to keep the computer in a central location, especially when their child's younger. I mean, I think there's an age where it's very appropriate to have more privacy, but uh, for a younger teen, having it in a very central location is important. And uh, there's some really terrific software out there that um, allows for some parental control. Although I've had a lot of parents tell me that their kid is smarter than in parental controls and they've disabled it. But I, I certainly encourage like a central location and, and as many parental controls as you can have in place. All right. Well, thank you all three again for your presentations today. If you have any closing remarks you'd like to share with the group, now's a great time. Um, I'd just like to, um, you know, thank the uh, the person who commented on, uh, you know, the education and as well as the, the risk and vulnerability of people with ASD. Um, you know, it is never our intent to vilify the person with ASD. And, uh, you know, they are absolutely right. They are much more uh, likely to be the victims of a crime, uh, including a sexual crime, than they are to be the perpetrators. Um, and uh, the other comment is absolutely correct, that oftentimes uh, children with autism are either pulled out of the classroom uh, when sexuality education is being provided, uh, or they're being provided with information about the mechanics that uh, does not get at the social aspect, which is where those challenges exist. So um, I'm, I'm grateful to both um, the people who provided those comments and that opportunity to clarify. Thank you. All right. Well, I know that there are some uh, questions that were submitted that we didn't get to today, and we'll be sure to follow up with 
you by email to answer those questions. Um, and you can also contact us at nccjdinfo at thearc.org if you come up with questions later. Uh, we'd like to invite you to download our initial white paper on sex offenders with IDD, um, which is available at the link on your screen right now. And then also our three presenters today have written a piece for us that will be published as soon as we can get it through our marketing department and we'll let you know when it's available. So thank you everyone for participating. Please, please fill out our survey when we finish up here. And um, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.